Welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to continue with the carburetor experiments on our 1969 Renault powered by a 670cc lawnmower engine from Harbor Freight. And along the way, we'll try some wacky ideas like is the original air filter better than our home brewed filter assembly? And what happens when we install a ram air induction system plus a lot more? <coughs> In the previous episode, we installed a 3D printed cross-flow spacer between the carburetor and the intake manifold. The purpose of the experimental spacer was to see if we could improve both performance and fuel economy. By the end of the previous video, we managed to shave a split second off the time it takes the car to accelerate up to 55 miles per hour, and the fuel economy also improved, but not so fast. You see, it's quite possible the cross-flow spacer actually had a negative effect on both performance and fuel economy. And the improvements that we saw were from other modifications. So let's backtrack a little bit and remove the cross-flow spacer so we can test the car again and verify what actually caused the improvement in fuel consumption. One of the obstacles that makes working on this carburetor difficult is this fuel shutoff solenoid. Now currently, this solenoid's been disabled and it actually serves no purpose other than getting in the way. So I checked around and I found this fuel solenoid block off plug offered by Performance 670. Now Performance 670 is not a sponsor, but I like to give a shout out to businesses that provide unique parts for the small engine hobbyist. Now that we have the carburetor off the engine, we can go ahead and remove the cross flow spacer. But first, let's get rid of the solenoid. Now like I mentioned previously, this solenoid has been disabled. It originally had this spring and plunger in it, and the purpose of the solenoid was to prevent backfires in the exhaust system when the engine was shut off. Meh, we don't care about that. So this solenoid plug will make getting the carburetor on and off the engine so much easier. I think at this point, we've had to remove the carburetor at least 10 times now in order to do the modifications to the jets and whatnot. So for me, it makes a big difference. All right. So here's the cross-flow spacer that we installed in the previous video. Well, let's set this aside for now and reassemble the carburetor. Some of the folks in the comment section recommended that I use grease when installing gaskets like this. And actually, this is a trick that I've seen on a video by Thunderhead289. Apparently, the grease keeps the gasket from sticking to the manifold and the carburetor, and it also provides good sealing properties. Fast forward a few minutes and the carburetor's back on the engine. We fiddled around with a few things and according to the wideband air fuel gauge, we were able to get an average air fuel ratio close to 13 and a half, which is kind of ideal for an air-cooled engine. I reckon we should take the car out for a spin and see if the car runs better without the cross-flow spacer. So without the cross-flow spacer, the engine definitely has better throttle response when accelerating, so that's strike one for the spacer. Now let's see if there's a difference in fuel economy. I'll let you folks in on a big secret, and that is I hate doing fuel economy tests. These tests take an enormous amount of time to conduct, and we really do try our best to report results from real-world driving. Well, within reason. You see, driving around rural Kansas ain't exactly what most folks do when they drive, but that's what works best for us. Now, today, it's about 90 degrees, and the wind is quite strong, so it'll be interesting to see how that affects the fuel economy. Also, since it's a bit on the hot side, we have the front windows rolled down, and that upsets some people because, well, it follows the aerodynamics. However, that's how this car was intended to be driven back in the day. Of course, the super skinny tires on this car are slightly overinflated, which is technically cheating, but we do that on all our cars to reduce the rolling resistance. And, well, that helps reduce the load on the little engine. You know, the skinny tires on this car, well, they're not much bigger than motorcycle tires, and due to the odd size, they're very expensive. Some folks have suggested that we use even skinnier tires, but that ain't possible because these are more or less the skinniest automotive tires available. And given that this car has a unique bolt pattern for the rims, well, there are pretty much no other low cost options. Really, I think these tires are just fine. So at the end of each fuel economy test, the car is rolled back into the shop and we use a fan to cool down the engine compartment. Now, more specifically, we want to make sure the tiny 2.5 gallon fuel tank is at room temperature before we determine how much fuel was consumed during the test. Checking the fuel consumption is made easy with a few unlikely tools. Now, before we started our fuel economy test, we set this combination square to the exact level in the fuel tank all we need to do now is to keep adding fuel to the tank until the level matches our gauge. 
And it looks like we need to add a decent amount of fuel to bring the level back up. So to measure the amount of fuel we put back in the tank, we're actually going to use something called the metric system. Apparently this bizarre system of measuring stuff is very accurate or something like that. Don't worry, I'll convert the results into numbers that everybody can understand. So far the tank has swallowed 3 liters of fuel and it still wants more. Here in Kansas, gasoline costs about $3.50 a gallon and diesel's hovering at $4 a gallon. Hmm, this stuff is getting expensive again. Hopefully, we'll see some good results from today's test. And it took exactly 4 liters of gasoline to bring the level back up to what we started with. So it took 4 liters of gasoline to go 44.9 miles on a hot and windy day in Kansas. That works out to 42.76 miles to the gallon and whatever that means in metric. Now keep in mind it was windy and typically we don't test when it's windy. So the next day we try it again and without the wind the car got 44.35 miles to the gallon. It's interesting how much the wind affects this car. So without the cross flow spacer the fuel economy is in fact better and I think it's obvious the reason we're seeing an improvement in fuel economy is the air fuel ratio is a bit leaner than it was in previous tests. Tests. That's good for the fuel economy, but how's that going to affect the acceleration performance? Well, we'll check that out later in the video. So one of the things I noticed about this carburetor setup is the upper intake manifold gets super cold when the engine is running. If we zoom in, we can actually see the remains of some condensation that formed on the manifold. So the reason the upper intake manifold gets really cold is not a mystery at all. This is common with carburetors and the short answer is this is due to the phase change when the gasoline goes from a liquid to a vapor. Generally cold is better I would think but back in the day Volkswagen found this phenomenon to be undesirable and they had to route some of the hot exhaust next to the intake manifold to improve performance. So this is an example of an intake manifold that was used on an air-cooled Volkswagen engine back in the day. Now the carburetor sits here and the air-fuel mixture travels down this manifold until it exits here and here. Now this smaller pipe is connected to the exhaust system and it provides a modest amount of heat to the manifold. Now according to the hardcore VW community, on a VW air-cooled engine, the intake manifold needs heat to help prevent the fuel from falling out of suspension before it's fed to the engine. If the fuel should fall out of suspension, well, the engine won't run as well and the fuel economy won't be as good. So that makes me wonder if the original air filter assembly and all the plastic covers are more than cosmetic and perhaps the covers keep the manifold warm. I don't know. But I bet we can find out. So with the silly plastic covers back on the engine, well, the upper intake manifold may be able to absorb some heat and perhaps we may see a difference in fuel economy. Let's check it out. Well, right away I noticed the difference with the plastic covers in place and the most noticeable thing is the engine is slightly less noisy. Also, I'm noticing the air-fuel ratio is slightly richer, but not by much. And now the hard part. I have to drive about 35 more miles before I can head back to the shop to see if the stock air filter is better or worse than the custom one. And through the magic of editing, we are done. Well, this is interesting. With the original air filter and all the plastic covers on the engine, the fuel economy dropped slightly. And to be realistic, this drop is within the margin of error. However, I did notice the wideband gauge was indicating an ever so slightly richer air fuel ratio. Hmm, the things we learn when we experiment, and we will get back to this shortly. So a few people have suggested that we try testing a ram air system that was common on some American cars back in the 1960s. And I have to say that's a brilliant idea. So keep in mind, sometimes folks suggest stuff that's insanely expensive and it would take a few weeks or months to build and test. And unfortunately this channel is just too small to be able to dump a lot of cash into some ideas. However, the ram air idea, well, it's simple and it's cheap. So let's give it a shot. And here it is. We built it from a bunch of scrap turbo intercooler pipes that we had lying around. And well, it ain't pretty. But keep in mind, this is only an experiment. And if it works, we'll build something that fits the car a lot better. Well, we didn't even get a chance to get the cameras rolling. You see, this Ram Air is very effective and without the air filter, we see the effects kick in at about 15 miles per hour and they ain't good. 
Apparently, we are forcing too much air into the carburetor, and according to the wideband air fuel meter, the mixture starts going lean at 15 miles an hour, and by the time we hit 20, well, the air fuel ratio is approaching 18 to 1, and this little air-cooled engine can't handle that. Hmm, well, let's try it again, but this time we'll use an air filter. Nope. However, this time around we got the car up to 30 miles per hour before the air fuel ratio went off the chart. Eh, well, let's try one more time. Yeah, this ain't much of a ram air, but at this point it's doubtful that anything's gonna work. Nope, 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 nope. Guess what? It just ain't gonna work. So I did a bit of research, and apparently the Ram air carburetors, like those used on older Pontiacs, are calibrated differently. Now what we're doing with our makeshift Ram air system is, we're putting positive pressure into the carburetor, and it's upsetting the way the Venturi works. Meh, it gets really complicated after that, and the short story is, this probably ain't gonna work on a lawnmower carburetor. Now here's something to consider. The way this air filter sits on the engine, well, it's exposed to a limited amount of wind turbulence when the car is going down the road. And that's interesting. You see, this setup isn't anything near a ram air system, but there is something I noticed. Now, with this air filter setup, the air fuel ratio tends to go slightly leaner when the car is going between 50 and 55 miles per hour. And that's exactly the speeds we go when we do our fuel economy tests. Now, when we tried the original air filter that came with this engine and all the plastic covers in place, the air fuel ratio was actually slightly richer no matter what speed we were going. So, of course, that could be due to the stock air filter being somewhat restrictive, but looking at it, it appears to be quite large, and it's hard to say if it's restrictive or not. But what we do know is, with all the plastic covers in place, the carburetor is not exposed to the air turbulence in the engine bay. Well, it's just a thought. Anyway, this carburetor seems a bit flaky, and perhaps it's time we try something different. Now, all the cool kids use giant Makuni flat side carburetors, and there are kits available to install one of those on this engine. But let's try something a little bit different. So this is a Kian, or sometimes pronounced Kahin, CVK carburetor. Now, a lot of folks don't like these carburetors, and that's understandable. You see, they're a bit more complicated than a normal carburetor. The CVK stands for Constant Velocity something. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what the K stands for. So this carburetor is a variable Venturi type, just like other Kian or Makuni carburetors are. Now on this side, we can see the throttle butterfly on this carburetor measures at 32 millimeter, but the actual Venturi size is variable. So when we open the secondary throttle, we can see inside the carburetor, and the Venturi is initially very small, and that's good because it provides excellent fuel atomization. What makes this carburetor different from other variable Venturi carburetors is the size of the Venturi will automatically change depending on the airflow, and that's done by a diaphragm located at the top of the carburetor. Theoretically, when you open the secondary throttle, the Venturi will also open up as well. But how much it opens? Well, that depends on the airflow. So a long story short, this type of variable Venturi carburetor will always have a Venturi size that provides the best fuel atomization. And it does this automatically. That's the theory. Anyway, I reckon we'll find out if that is true or not. Now to get this carburetor to fit the Predator engine, I picked up a CNC milled manifold from Performance 670. Now this manifold was actually made for a Makuni flat side carburetor, but we can make it work with this Kian carburetor with a few modifications. And what I mean by that is, this boot I got for the Kian carburetor fits like a glove, but the bolt holes don't line up with the manifold, and that's an easy fix. There's enough material in the manifold to allow us to drill and tap new holes for this boot. Now this carburetor was made for a 400cc Honda TRX, so the jet sizes will likely be wrong, but no fear. I also picked up a bunch of jets so we can tune this carburetor exactly the way we want it. Now, unfortunately, I'm still waiting on the throttle cable, so we can't do this upgrade today, but it'll definitely be in the next Predator-powered Renault video for sure. So at this point, I think it's time to take the car out one more time today and find out if tuning it for better fuel economy helps or hurts performance.
Okay, we're all set to do the 0 to 55 mile per hour acceleration run. Now, for the new viewers, the 670cc lawnmower engine is not the only weird thing about this car. It also has both a CVT transmission and a 4-speed manual transmission. For the acceleration run, we'll be starting off in third gear. Now, if that seems weird, then I recommend you watch the previous episodes in order to get better acquainted with how this car was put together. The time to beat is 33.60 seconds. Not too shabby. It looks like we shaved another two and a half seconds off the acceleration time. Just for giggles, let's go for 60. The time to beat is 53 seconds. A lot of folks indicated the CVT clutch may be going through its full range too quickly, and on this acceleration run, it appears the CVT reached its 1 to 1 ratio at around 30 miles per hour. I think we'll look into that, and we do have the parts in stock to make the modifications. However, before we fiddle with the CVT, I want to get the key and carburetor dialed in and verify it makes a difference. I hope that makes sense. Back in episode 22, we recorded some baseline data. Now, back then our top speed was 64 miles per hour, and the last time we checked, the car was capable of going 66 miles per hour. So, we really haven't focused on top speed because it's scary to drive this car faster than 60 miles per hour. Scary. Anyway, back then it took 51 seconds to get the car up to 55 miles per hour. Now we can do it in 31 seconds. So, overall, we shaved a whopping 20 seconds off the acceleration time. The fuel economy wasn't half bad at 37 miles per gallon. However, we managed to improve it quite a bit and now we're looking at 44.35 miles to the gallon. Now, as most of you folks know, this project is not about fuel economy. We're actually trying to build a race car with a lawnmower wrench <laughs> or something like that. Apparently, the cross-flow spacer that we installed in the previous episode, well, that wasn't ideal. I reckon there may be some benefits if we could control when the cross-flow happens. Perhaps it would work better if we could enable it only in the upper RPM range, like some of you folks have suggested. Anyway, I'm looking forward to experimenting with the Kian Constant Velocity Variable Venturi Carburetor. And perhaps we can see some more improvements with this relatively stock 670cc engine. So the 719cc three-cylinder Kubota turbo diesel Saturn, well, that's still the fastest thing we've created in our humble little workshop. Sadly, the tags and insurance on the Saturn will expire in a few weeks, and we won't be renewing them. You see, the special parts that are in the Saturn, well, they're slated to be used in a different project car. The good news is, we need to do a few more tests on the Saturn, and that episode will be coming up soon, perhaps as soon as next week. I'm actually not sure, and it's still a mystery to me. If you've managed to make it to this point in the video, please take a moment and click on the like button. And if you're not already subscribed, please consider subscribing. This is the only channel on YouTube where you'll find this type of content. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I'll see you next time.